Good morning and welcome to the 12th in a series of ICJ Kenya's Justice and Rule of Law webinars. Our session today is jointly convened by the International Justice Mission. Thank you for finding time to join us. My name is Julie Wayuamadeka and my co-moderator for today is Agre Juma from the IJM. We wish to kickstart this webinar with a performance, a lively performance that is, from Javan the Poet and Anthem Republic. Over to you Javan and Anthem, thank you. Um, Javan and Anthem, do you mind unmuting your microphones, please? Are we good? Yes, we are. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much for having us perform on this particular event. And uh, with me is Anthem Republic, Baraka the saxophonist, and Yani. We're going to do two pieces that talk about the issues that are happening, and particularly enforced disappearances. Thank you. Nani anajazameli, 
Nani akashinda hesi the system to convince Alisema shoot to kill God is a love of us being Kama mbaya mbaya ndo tambos tunamaliza generation Ama player no ya uniform Player judge uniform Kwa wote kwa street Shiko investigator love to kill Familia za victims in the bullets But a player Ama pathology wa kavana Mocha wa pati clients Wewe Na wewe Citizens na low no love. Land cruisers in Megeuka has to ferry body bags. Forest dogs in Meja body parts. See what to the animals for killers for Pupu. You should not to a bullet squad brought a laugh for media on a pop. I could not like to end your time if you go I could not change what you would be making a court. I could not justice for years against Zico Post, not with guns, but with our voices to challenge your mind to where we now where we now where we see and force up where we need. I'm approaching my brain. Brave? Brave is no longer my name. My name is extrajudicial killing candidate. And an OCS somewhere is expecting me to pass. So let me pass this message before I pass. Because I live for the moment. More? More are not meant for me. God's plan. Never. A fan day's plan. Afande, ka unanga rada jiro kitu kifyo tuwa hoi na mada mtu chagwe la. So ka spirit ka kikwambia uwa kambie la. Lazimu utuwe yo ni lai tunadimu kwa pamile nye shakwa reshwa giza. Pamile nye na visi wenge kuwa mchezo wa pigiza. Juleta premina ya unka enele kuche stream. Premiyake kumeza saati ya kodi mkukos wili kwa nabrada hini li. No shangu ya uza yorimu. So then you have just been back in one of our cando. Mama, you want to go home? We move, we lift up the door. We raise the sword, we give it cando. You do not have to let that be the cando, God. This is your job, but please prepare our hearts. Big thing, I wish. 
Now we spoon at the only back. Now we spoon at next year, but here now the only wish in the back in the corner. The only now wish. Now we spoon it to a mother with your own license. Now we wish. Now we should wish this if I want it is to the classical man of the little Uma. Uma, you know, some of the little you have a fight of the night. The woman who is a tumor in a book of one side, you have a class to be a anthem for that deep deep performance welcome to those of you who have just joined us today our topic of discussion is criminalizing and forced disappearance and advancing accountability for torture in kenya this particular conversation is further amplified as it is the commemoration of willie kimani joseph mirore and joseph Mwenda. my name is julie wayuamadeka from the icj kenya and my name is agri juma from international justice mission June 23rd is a significant day to us at the International Justice Mission, the legal fraternity, civil society actors, and the whole nation, as it is the day when my colleague, Willie Kimani, our client, Josphat Mwenda, and taxi driver, Joseph Moirori, were abducted as they left court in Mavoko. Following their abduction, they were disappeared for one week during which time their whereabouts and fate or fate were both unknown and denied. Our discussion today on enforced disappearances is inspired by this week long disappearance of the Mavoko three, which was followed by a chance discovery of their tortured bodies in Oldonio Sabuk. We would like to recognize other Kenyan families, survivors of enforced disappearances, some of whom still do not know the whereabouts or fate of their loved ones. The discussion is also timely as it falls in the same week as the International Day in support of victims of torture. It is our hope that through these discussions today, we will commence dialogue that will culminate into actionable steps towards sanctioning and forced disappearances 
in Kenya. This conversation is also taking place on social media under the hashtag end enforced disappearances and the hashtag wakowapi. To engage us in this discussion is a panel of distinguished jurists and legal practitioners who bring on board immense experience and expertise on the subject matter. Allow me to briefly introduce them to you. First of all, we have Victor Kamau, the Deputy Director of the Kenyan National Commission on Human Rights. We have Hussein Halid, Executive Director, Haki Africa. Waimaida Kimani, Director of Systems Reforms at the International Justice Mission. Nelson Harvey, President of the Law Society of Kenya. Lee Fang, the Senior Human Rights Advisor, Office of the UN High Commission for Human Rights. And last but certainly not least, Nudin Haji, the Director of Public Prosecutions, the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. We wish to thank all our panelists for joining us today. And with that, I wish to ask Agri to set the scene of what it is we are, we are here to discuss today. To provide context, we will commence this session with two stories of families that have suffered enforced disappearances. The first is the case of Daniel Baru Nyamohanga that is summarized in a video which we will now watch. All right, kindly bear with us as we set up the video. That would be the first story. The second story uh, will be the case uh, from Mombasa of Athuman Mohammed Haji, um, whose brother will give an account of the disappearance um, that took place early in this year. Mohammed. Okay. Ndugu yake Athmani Muhammad ambaye alipotea siku ya tarehe 16 June sorry January tarehe 16 wakati ametoka msikitini anaelekea nyumbani na ikatokezea gari ikamshika njiani ikamvamia na kumweka kwa ndani Gari yenyewe ni KCD 594S. Gari hiyo ilipomweka ndani ikatoweka naye hapaka leo hatujui hatima yake na hatujampata. Na tungeomba kama utakuwa na uwezekano na msaidizi wowote ndugu yetu huyu tumpate tujue yuko wapi ili huzuni hii imalizike kwa sababu hatuna raha kwa kasa hii familia kwa sababu hatujui yuko wapi wala yuko hai ama yuko hali gani na kesi hii tuliripoti police eh, police eh, makupa police station lakini paka leo hatujapata habari yoyote kuhusu yeye na OB namba ya case ilikuwa ni OB 2617 stroke 1 stroke 2020 Sasa tungeomba usaidizi wote kwa ndugu yetu huyu ama shirika hizi zitufanyie usaidizi kwa njia yoyote tupate tujue hatima zao ni vipi na matatizo haya hayakuanza kwa ndugu yangu huyu matatizo haya yameanza hata kwa wengine ambao ni katika familia yangu ambao ni wameshukuliwa lamu kuna baadhi wakaachiliwa watatu mwingine ambao ni wanne anaitwa Idris Idris Omar Banadi paka leo naye hatumjui yuko wapi na hajaachiliwa ni kama ndugu yetu Athmani vile vile hatujui yuko wapi paka sasa hivi tungeomba mashirika haya tungeomba sana kama kuna uwezekano tujue ndugu zetu hawa wako wapi tutasaidika vipi na tuna matumaini makubwa huenda 
tukapata usaidizi kutokana na haya mashirika so tungeomba sana tu pate usaidizi na tupate matumaini tuko na matumaini kuhusu mambo kama haya kwa vile kama tu vile tumetafutwa kuja kuelezea shida zetu na tumezileta na ni matumaini yetu kwamba shida hizi huenda zikawa tumepata ajibu na tukajua hatima za hawa watu wako wapi au kuachiliwa kama wameshikiliwa mimi ningependa kutoa shukurani zangu kwa wenye wote na kwa wale shiriki wote na kama kuna la zaidi wengine watakuniuliza jambo lolote mimi niko tayari kujibu kulingana na mambo kama haya yalivyotokezea kuhusu ndugu zangu hawa asanteni sana Asante sana na Jim na asanti sana pia kwa Haki Afrika ambao wameweza kusaidia kuwezesha um, mazungumzo yako siku ya leo and so we'd like to go back to the video that we were to play um maybe maybe we'll we'll, we'll first go to some questions to the DPP um who is with us and who has an other meeting shortly after this and so we'd like to take uh, this opportunity while he's still with us to ask some of the questions that we would want to ask before we go to the video that we were to play thank you so much dpp for joining us thank you thank you for for having me um i'd start with the case of 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 daniel baru which um um we had shared earlier concerning um the the issues around it and and which we will show shortly i know your team is with us and if there will be any questions they will be able to ask they will be able to answer um the final order in the case of daniel baru was directed to your office to charge for murder appreciating that the office of the dpp is an independent office and acknowledging that these families desire justice how do you balance the role and independence of your office while assisting these families to realize their aspirations of justice um, by pursuing accountability for enforced disappearances um, thank you thank you very much um, um this is a very uh, um very emotional subject to to deal with um but I, I will try my best to to answer the questions uh, put across to me um as as you all know um dan um daniel baru disappeared around the 17th of january 2017 um or was arrested around that time and disappeared um uh, from um, the police custody and uh, um the directions that we were given by the judiciary is that um, ODPP um sorts to or within its uh, independence um seeks to to prosecute or direct investigations on, on the on the matter um of course as you all know article 25 of, of the constitution um uh, envisages that habeas corpus is uh Uh, a rate that uh, cannot be limited um and that it is also captured in the section 389 of the criminal um, procedure code uh, of to to uh, un, um of 2000 the amended uh, procedure criminal procedure code of 2009 um and as odpp we have uh, tried our best to follow up on this uh, case with the help of uh, ijm and other um institutions um uh, we've tried to work with ipoa also um it has not been easy to identify the particular inspector or the ocs who was involved who apparently um um retired and uh, is not within uh, within kenya apparently um so we're still trying to work on that of course um the independence of the odpp uh in 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 um, ensuring that uh, 
the orders given by court are um, adhered to um, depends on the evidence that is tabled before us as ODPP. Um, the burden of proof on uh, an application on, of, of habeas corpus uh, still remains on the petitioner. On, and on this particular case, there, there, there was enough evidence that uh, uh, the individual was in police, police custody. But for example, in the case of Mohammed, um, who was just spoken here, it is very difficult when an individual uh, is not booked into police, um, you know, in a police station and in the OB uh, for a particular person to be able to prove that an individual was in, in police custody. Um, it is also very difficult when you don't have the investigators or the police um, agreeing uh, to, um, to cooperate with the, with, with the investigators and also the prosecutors. So it, it, is, it is quite a tall order when the burden of proof is on the petitioner. Um, and eventually later on when you have to rely, um, for us as ODPP, we have to rely on investigators uh, to ensure that uh, um, we have the evidence to prosecute those who were involved in um, uh, you know, enforced disappearances. As a country, under Article 2 of the, of the Constitution, um, we are bound by international conventions. I think we are a, we are a party and we have signed uh, the Rome Statute um, <clears throat> under the, under the um, I'm trying to remember the act, but under um, the International Crimes Act of 2008, um, we have defined, I mean, there's the, uh, uh, it, it talks about a person who in Kenya or elsewhere commits a crime against humanity. And if you look at the definition of crimes against humanity, it does include enforced disappearances. So we are bound to investigate and also prosecute once the evidence is stable. Um, and our, as ODPP, um, um, you ask the question um, of how do we assist these families? We are bound uh, within our, our our mandate to assist and actually prosecute where there, there is evidence uh, 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 on behalf of the Republic and of course, by extension of the victims and, and the complements in, 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 in situations where enforced disappearances has occurred. As I said, this, this is a very emotional subject um, as all DPP and myself as DPP, um, I do not condone and such actions, and I believe the government also does not condone such actions, but this happens. Um, and the onus then, once the happiest corpus, uh, once that burden of proof has been, has, been, has been proven, the onus is on the government then to show that if there is any detention, it is lawful and it is constitutional. And if it is not, um, then um, action has, and must be taken. Of course, again, I repeat, as ODPP, we depend on the fire and the evidence that is stable for us to be able to prosecute. And we cannot prosecute if we don't have that. I hope I've tried my best to answer that question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. DPP, for that um, insight into the challenges that go into even the prosecution of, that case, of those cases. And you've actually mentioned something of great importance, which is the international instrument. So I want to pose a question to you, which is drawing from your experience as a lawyer and in your interaction with investigations and prosecutions at different levels, what are the areas you see the need for intervention, be it policy, process, or legislative, or even behavior change to be addressed to handle and force disappearances and instances of torture? Um, thank you. I think out of experience, um, First of all, I'll talk about behavior change. Out of experience, um, the public doesn't seem to have a lot of trust in government institutions. And a lot of time when you have the disappearances, you have either nobody coming up as a witness other than the complainant. And it becomes a, a tall order 
uh, for investigations to proceed successfully. Uh, and what I would urge the public is to be, um, to you know, take the, the leap of faith and be more uh, bold in terms of um, giving the evidence. Of course, the onus is also on, on the government and us to ensure that we provide conducive atmospheres, uh, to ensure that, um, and build that trust. As ODPP, we, we are trying our best to build the trust between us and the public um, so, so that such uh, information and evidence is more forthcoming. Um, of course, uh, you know, uh, civil society is very important and it is, it is key. A lot of individuals involved in this uh, seem to have more trust with uh, the civil society whom we have also reached out so to allow us to be able to work uh, and serve the public uh, more efficiently. And if you look at, uh, for example, Willie Kimani, a lot of evidence and a lot of help came from IJM. Um, and I think without uh, the role of IJM in this, we would not have gotten to where we are today in, in court, for example. Um, and many other cases where we've worked with Haki Africa um, and other um, civil society. Um, so there is that issue of if the public doesn't trust the government agencies, then they should be able to trust the civil um, organizations, uh, the civil society, and give more information. On the other hand, I think there is a lot more that can be done, especially with police, because a lot of enforced disappearances are, attribu are attributed to the police. Uh, pro proper recording uh, at, the, at the police stations, uh, that is very important. Um, of course, the policy has to be also changed um, at both uh, uh, the police and the other agencies um, to be more responsive to um, you know, cases of the enforced disappearances. There has been a lot of allegations that um, investigating uh, agencies are not very responsive, but we are trying to work uh, on that. And we are trying to work as much as, as, much as possible with both IPOA and uh, the Kenya, the, the government human rights uh, organization um, uh, to ensure that um, a more uh, proactive policy by government is, is formulated um, uh, to build more user-friendly um, environments for uh, individuals who want to complain and who have uh, um, issues with um, uh, enforced disappearances. Um, we have tried to enhance, for example, witness protection. We are also working with witness, witness protection, but we are trying to ensure that witness protection is well funded and well facilitated to allow for those who are afraid, um, for example, to give evidence or who think that they might, might be harmed, then they can be brought under witness protection. But that, that also um, you know, um, requires more responsive policies to be formulated uh, and, also on, and also adequate fundings. Um, of course, more cooperation between us and uh, the civil um, society. Since I took office, I've tried to do that and we will keep on trying to enhance um, our um, coordination and, and, and collaboration. Uh, uh, and lastly, and I think everybody here uh, will agree with that, is of course police reforms. Um, there is need for more police uh, reforms, uh, but this needs to be worked out um, with all um, the criminal justice uh, players, um, whether it is the civil society, the law society of Kenya, uh, the, the ODPP as a distinct institution, the, the human rights institution and IPOR and others within the criminal justice system um, so that we can have the desired reforms um, that have not yet been achieved. I hope uh, I've been able to address the question adequately. Thank you. You have, thank you very much. Um, we understand that we are strapped for time because you have to check into another meeting, but we have one question specifically directed to you in the comments section. It's from Mr. Charles Gidui who asks, when does the DPP invoke its powers to conduct prosecution led investigations? <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> I, I don't think there is any 
you can't say that um, uh, there is any, um, the, the thing is that there are no guidelines. And what we've done is we've come up with the, the decision to charge guideline. And under the decision to char charge guideline, we have tried to enumerate when um, a prosecution led investigation can, can, can occur. Um, uh, there is, as I said, there's a lot of reform that will be, will be required um, to ensure that it is properly anchored. Um, it, there is, I must admit, there's a lot of resistance when that happens. Um, but even when um, a file comes to us before we make a decision, if there are areas to cover, we try and give directions to the investigators which areas they need to go and investigate. So that, in essence, can um, uh, be equated to um, you know, prosecution-led investigations because then you ask them specifically to go and deal with certain areas. Um, we have been uh, careful with that uh, because uh, um, that aspect is captured under the Act, uh, but is not very clear in the Constitution. Perhaps um, the current uh, uh, reviews uh, under the BBI, <laughs> some of you can suggest for that if you think it will it will play a, a, a more um, um, it will add more value into into investigations. Um, so the kind of um, prosecution-led investigations that we, we've been involved in is once a file comes in and you ask the different uh, investigative um, bodies to um, cover areas uh, that uh, would, would that would actually um, force them to go down to the ground and do the investigations as directed by the ODPP. Thank you. We would like to release you. We understand that some of uh, your team members will stay yes, with us. I, yes, and my we'll deputy. Be able to answer questions. Yes, my deputy, um, Madam Dr. Sodor, uh, will, will be will be here for you. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Thank, thank you, you so much, much, and welcome to Madam Dr. Sodor. At this time, we'd like to go back to the video that we were to play. Um, earlier on the case of Daniel Baru Nyamohanga before we proceed with the panel discussion. engage us on social media through our various platforms at IJM Kenya, at ICJ Kenya. You can also reach out to the various panelists and their institutions through their social media platforms. You can also bring in your question in the question and answer session. And during the question and answer session, during the plenary session, we will have an opportunity for you to voice your question to the respective panelists. You can do so by raising your hand and the team and the technical team will get in touch with you in regards to how you can voice your question during the plenary session. I do believe that now we can switch to the plenary discussion as, as planned. I, I just needed to confirm on the video. All right. Okay, seems the video is ready. bora hivi ile Mungu alisema kifo kitakuja kuwatenganisha kati ya wili. Mimi sikupenda mwanadamu atutenganishe. Mimi na mzee wangu ila kifo. Hata alikuwa anaomba mrebeko utakuja kunizika mke wangu na mimi nitakuja kukuzika. Mzee alikamata tarehe 12 mwezi wa kwanza mfumbiri kumi na saba
ilipofika saa tano yule ambaye anakaa karibu na chaji naelekea saa sita yule ambaye anakaa karibu na chaji akaamka akasema wale watu wote mlikuja kuona watu wenyu ambao walikamata tarehe 12 tunaomba muondoke kotini watu wenu hawana hatia ya kustakiwa ama ya kuingia mahakamani kwamba wana stakiwa tukaamka watu wote kuamka tu kwenye koti pale kuingia hivi tuna close hivi tuingie kwenye geti la koti tena na wao tukakutana na wao tena wanatenimsho na gari ya polisi walikuwa hivyo hivyo watu sita hivyo hivyo mzee wangu alikuemo kufika pale station maana tukasikia nipe vitu yangu nipe vitu yangu nipe vitu yangu yani tulisikia tu pale sauti nipe vitu yangu nipe vitu yangu tukasikia wanasukuma wamesukuma wote hakuna mfereto tukauliza jamani bwana mlisema mnaenda tulisema tuliambiwa kote tunaenda kupatia watu wetu tena mmewarudisha ndani kwa nini ofisa akasema nendeni mpaka kesho muje kesho kando na katafuta yeye na kamuona siku ya mahakama kiangi siku moja tangu hapo sasa kana kana yali ni acha nikiona watoto watatu msan osano wawili kijana mmoja alinipenda alinijali kama bibi yake na alipenda watoto wake ni mtu ambaye alikuwa anapenda sana kukaa karibu na watoto wake na kile chote mtoto alikuwa anahitaji alikuwa anampatia mpaka sasa hivi aja atoke watoto wamehangaika huko na kule wakiniuliza mama baba yuko wapi mbona hatujai muona baba na ulitwambia anaenda kutafuta mali ya sijai muona nikawaambia watoto baba yenu alikamata mpaka sasa hivi wanyo kwani huko kukamata baba mbono wengine wanakamata wanarudi kwani ni baba yetu ajarudi ako na watoto ako na mke sasa hivi kana mtoto wake hawa watanda shule na mwanangu na ni atawasomesha na mimi kuna nguvu mimi na kusiku wa msie ewe mungu bajuba njia zangu ya tengeze ale siwezi asongeze wewe ndiye nguvu ya wanyonge ewe mungu bajua njia zangu ya tengeze ale siwezi asongeze wewe ndiye nguvu ya wanyonge nalilia yatima wajane kama hana maspouse damu crime for justice itaran kama ji kwa fereji state house so this is um a heavy scopus by his family represented by the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights in discharge of its mandate to protect the fundamental right to life and liberty enshrined in chapter 4 the bill of rights prosecution investigate and bring to book all other officers culpable towards the death of Daniel Barunyamwanga these are the orders of this court for a family that has waited for more than one and a half for nearly one and a half years to know where their loved one is and still does not know where their loved one is is something that's very very important it's a momentous decision because the law is there to protect people and there should be no people who live outside the protection of the law Ole mama pole, ole mama pole, ole mama pole.
Thank you. This video is available on the Missing Voices uh, YouTube account in case you need to review it. I'd like to direct this next question to Victor Kamau, an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and who was involved heavily in representation, in legal representation in the case that we have just seen of Daniel Baru Nyamohanga. Wakili Victor. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. In 2017, the Kenya National Commission of Human Rights offered legal representation in the case of Daniel Baru Nyamohanga. While it is rare to succeed in getting a writ of habeas corpus, this was achieved in this case. What made this possible in your assessment and what are some of the challenges that you experienced in conducting this habeas corpus case? and others that you know about. Thank you. Um, firstly, I think this was a very clear cut case. Uh, the uh, arrest and incarceration of Baru was very well um, documented. And um, as we went to court, we went knowing that there was a good link between his being in custody at Kehancha police station and he's being disappeared. Uh, therefore, that was uh, one reason why the habeas was successful. I think also uh, a, a, a good reason why it was successful is some of the evidence included a very, very clear forgery of the OB uh, to show that he had been released on the 17th of January at 11 o'clock, and yet his uh, wife said that he, she had seen him at 4 o'clock, at 4 p.m. on that same day in the cells. And uh, the police uh, uh, tried to squeeze in some entry at 11 o'clock, uh, which, which the court saw right through and actually uh, observed in its judgment that that was fraudulent. Uh, so I think that um, that was a one specific case where it was much, much, much easier to prove habeas corpus. In many, many cases that uh, we've done as a commission, uh, starting in 2007, we found that the big problem was that uh, there was no record of the incarceration, abduction, or disappearance of uh, any of the people that uh, that petitioned for habeas corpus. And the courts, of course, were very cautious and just said, unfortunately, we couldn't prove. We are doing one in Garissa right now where um, the witness is actually the sister of um, the disappeared. And uh, the thing that will probably make it uh, doable is that she saw the victim very heavily, very heavily tortured under uh, police arrest. So I think it just really depends on the nexus between the incarceration and the disappearance. Now, some of the challenges, I have to say that one challenge we faced was that even after we applied for habeas corpus and served the AG and the inspector, uh, inspector general of police, they did not enter 
her parents in court. They just weren't interested at all, at all. And uh, after some time, the court just suggested, well, why don't you just invite the office of the DPP and thank that office very much because they actually, in the end, put a presence in for the state. Uh, but that was one uh, challenge. And the other challenge was that we found the process of the court very interminable. Um, and I, I guess the court uh, was also laboring under the challenges that we were uh, also laboring under because um, the, uh, the matter proceeded like an ordinary constitutional petition. And you know, a heaviest corpus is a heaviest corpus. It's a very urgent, urgent application because of course, if uh, there is an exhumation to be done, it has to be done before uh, what uh, Shakespeare calls in Hamlet, that convocation of politic ones has eaten the deceased too much. So we, we, we experienced that challenge. Another challenge was also that Um, Mr. Victor Kamau's internet. Um, as we wait for the technical team to resolve the issue, we can quickly move to Haki Africa. If you are with us, Halid, um, are you with us? Yes, I can see you there. All right. Um, Haki Africa has documented many cases of enforced disappearance over the years. There are those who support enforced disappearance as a justification for policing high crime areas. Briefly share your experience on the prevalence trends and challenges encountered in monitoring, documenting, and pursuing accountability for enforced disappearances during this period. Um, thank you very much. And let me begin by uh, appreciating what ITJ and IGN are doing in uh, bringing this issue to you. It's something that has really affected many, many families uh, you know, from, the north, uh, from the coast of Kenya, from Northeastern and uh, different parts of our country and the, global, uh, the globe in general. And uh, yes, uh, when, um, you know, as an organization, Haki Africa has over the years been documenting and post disappearances. Just the volume. Just, yes, so far. Yes. Sorry, your volume is a bit low. Is it possible for you to increase the volume on your side? Yeah, sure. Let me try to do that. Can you hear me now? Yes, it's yes. much better. Yes. So um, I was explaining that um, so far this year, we've uh, documented about 18 cases from the six counties of uh, coast. Last year, we had about uh, 32 cases that we documented and, of course, shared with the authorities uh, on enforced disappearances. And uh, the challenges are, you know, quite, quite a number. Uh, to begin with, uh, it's, uh, you know, expectations of the family. Uh, we had uh, Najim speaking at the beginning of this uh, webinar. Najim is an individual whom we've worked with uh, for, you know, since the disappearance of Khan. And this is a disappearance that was captured by, on uh, CCTV. And uh, this information, again, was uh, shared with the authorities. We also uh, used our social media platforms to again uh, screen what actually happened and ask members of the public to share any information. So the first challenge that people, I mean, uh, in organizations like Haki Africa get is the expectations of the family. Of course, when they report to you, they expect something to be done. They usually come with lots of hopes that probably their loved ones will be found. And for me, that is the greatest challenge because uh, particularly cases of enforced disappearances, they are very difficult to handle, you know, because one, it's difficult to prove that actually it was the police. In the case of uh, Athman, uh, which Najim uh, very well uh, expounded, we know and believe that uh, this is the work of uh, security agencies. Uh, we know that uh, Athman uh, was uh, held in a place where three others were later released, and those who were released confirmed that they actually met with Athman in this uh, mansion of some sort. 
from our calculations, it was in, uh, in uh, Malindi area. But you know, there's very little you can do because as a human rights organizations, you don't have investigative powers. The best you can do is push the authorities to actually do something. So the challenge of having to go back to the families telling them that uh, you know we've done the best we can. We've actually reported this to the police, we've reported to IPOA, we've reported to the DPP, and then now you have to tell them that we just have to sit and wait. It becomes very challenging. Uh, we've uh, also experienced the challenge of using courts. Um, in many, in many uh, cases that we've gone to court with, uh, we've found that uh, the courts are actually not in a position to assist. Uh, of course, the burden of proof in uh, habeas corpus case lies on the petitioner. Uh, the best you can do is actually present videos. But then most of these people who actually pick uh, individuals, in most cases, are dressed in civilian clothing. They do introduce themselves as police. They're usually very armed. But then, you know, beyond that, it becomes difficult. There is one case of uh, Hamed who was picked at uh, Masjid Musa, where the police were, you know, we had videos and pictures. The guy was handcuffed, he was put in a police vehicle, um, and we went to court with that. We tried as much as we can, but at the end, the judge only, uh, in his ruling, ordered for a public inquiry. So again, uh, it's challenging because, yes, you want the courts to act, you want uh, decisions like uh, the one my brother Victor has talked about, but then you, you, you can actually see the challenge. So that's the second uh, great challenge, that is uh, using courts to actually litigate uh, enforced disappearances and habeas corpus cases. The third challenge that we experience is actually of the public. In many communities, uh, the public believe that those who are, uh, and I mean, forcefully disappeared, uh, individuals who have uh, issues to do with crime, particularly uh, violent extremism, but then also um, common crime. And when this happens, you actually find members of the public uh, supporting some of these incidences. So you find that the police and uh, the security agencies continue to do what they do, believing that the public is standing with them. But we all know as lawyers, as human rights practitioners, that uh, due process must be followed. And when due process is not followed, then we must hold those responsible accountable for their, uh, for their excesses. So that is a big challenge in that the public itself uh, does not understand the challenges of law, does not understand that these are issues of human rights that we must stand by. And then uh, it actually emboldens the security agencies to continue doing what they are doing. So for me, these are great challenges. And last but not least is the security of human rights defenders. Uh, we know uh, in various uh, times or uh, uh, places in time, we have had these challenges uh, where we've had to even uh, relocate our offices, even uh, have to take some of our staff uh, to hiding places because of the security risk that they were put through because of uh, you know, enforced disappearance cases. Presently, we are following up, like I said, 18 cases alone this year. Some of them are very serious and very high powered individuals are involved in these cases. Some of them even sitting governors presently holding office. So these are serious challenges that human rights defenders are then exposed to. And it's a big challenge to ensure that uh, security is guaranteed for your contribution. I mean, what you have said holds dear because these are issues of human rights and we cannot take the law into our hands and there is no justification for that. Um, over to you, Agri. Thank you. I'd like to direct the next question to Madam Lee Fang from the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights here in Kenya. As an international partner in the human rights space, are we doing enough to ensure that violations such as enforced disappearances are addressed? And what lessons can Kenya take from other jurisdictions that have addressed similar challenges with enforced disappearances? Thank you. Um, and it's good to be here um, with you all today. I think it's very clear that to address enforced disappearances, it's important first to recognize that this is an issue and to criminalize it and then to take action to prevent and end impunity for disappearances. I think that there's um, steps that Kenya has started but has not completed. For example, 
uh, Kenya signed in February 2007 the International Convention for the Prote Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearances. And this convention is a really important um, treaty that sets out a range of actions that states are, are, are to take. Yet Kenya has not yet ratified it. And I think this would be an important step. Um, the convention does require states parties to criminalize enforced disappearances under national law, which is not yet the case in, in Kenya. If it was ratified, the, the convention would apply directly under Kenyan law institutions, so that, that would assist. Um, the convention also requires effective investigations to hold perpetrators criminally responsible. And um, I think very importantly, it, it addresses some of the issues that have been raised today, such as the protection of victims, witnesses, relatives, and lawyers who are seeking accountability, the right to know the truth, and also the right to reparation. And there's been a number of questions in the, in the chat box about compensation and relief. Um, and the convention does provide for um, reparations that can look at rehabilitation, can, which can look at compensation and look at guarantees and non-repetition. Non um, so I do think that ratific ratification and implementation would be an important step for Kenya. Um, I think another important point to make is that enforced disappearances often lead to extrajudicial executions, as sadly demonstrated by the killings of Willie, Joseph and Joseph. And so action must equally be taken to strengthen the investigation and prosecution of extrajudicial killings because accountability for violations is a key step in preventing their, their occurrence. In terms of lessons which can be drawn from other jurisdictions, globally, Latin America has been the region that has had the highest numbers in, of enforced dis disappearances, which have been linked to past and present armed conflicts, armed violence, and also migration. It's estimated that some 200,000 people have disappeared in the region in the, in, the, in the past two decades. But there are some countries in Latin America that have actually taken some steps and made progress in, ad in addressing enforced disappearances. And I think that a couple of these, um, these steps to highlight is that there's a number of countries, including Argentina, Peru, and Chile, which have, both, which have all struggled to deal with the legacy of enforced disappearances. They not only ratified the Convention um, on Enforced Disappearances, but they also recognized the competence of the Committee on Enforced Disappearances to receive and consider individual complaints from either victims or um, on behalf of individuals who have claimed to be victims of violations of the Convention. So this provides an external um, mechanism when redress is not forthcoming from within the state. Uh, I think that's there's, there's only one country in Africa so far um, that has done the same, which is Mali. I think another important um, example is uh, legislation that has been enacted in Mexico and Peru. Uh, they've en enacted laws on enforced disappearances and on or, or on missing persons. And they've set up databases to, to assist in the search for missing persons. So I think these are concrete steps that could be taken and they, they can be taken as examples. Thank you. Thank you for that well-informed uh, response. All right. Um, thank you, Madam Li Fang. Now we switch over to IJM, to Ms. Momaida Kimani. IJM sits in a very unique position in this discourse. As a justice institution, you have represented people whose loved ones have disappeared. Particularly, IJM is on record as an observer in the Dan Baru case that we have just discussed. However, in 2016, it hit closer to home when Willie Kimani, his client Josphat Mwendoa, and the taxi driver Josphat Mirori were disappeared and found killed. From a personal experience and your assessment of the cases that you have been involved in as well, what, what is it as an outsider, the nation duty bearers don't realize or don't appreciate that sees them not prioritizing these particular cases? Uh, thank you, Julie. The... And thank you to the other panelists. I think I'll pick up from where Lee ended. One of the things that perhaps most people don't realize with these particular cases is tied to what the Convention on the Protection of People Against Enforced Disappearances defines as enforced disappearances. So this is instances where there's an arrest, uh, there's detention, or there's an abduction, ultimately an in a situation of deprivation of liberty of a person. And this person uh, just, 
you know, to the rest of us, they just disappear. One minute they're there, the next minute they're not there. And then following this deprivation of liberty is a refusal by state agents to acknowledge that this person has disappeared or to even make efforts towards explaining what the fate of this particular person is. And so what happens with that is actually what the convention defines at the end. You keep this person outside the protection of the law, that it is impossible for this person to be protected and it becomes then an ongoing violation. And let me explain what, an on, what we mean when we say an ongoing violation. So you have someone who is missing. You don't know what has happened to them. Are they alive? Are they dead? Are they within jurisdiction? Are they not within jurisdiction? Then you also have loved ones and family who, as Halid was saying, struggle with hope. You know, it's, it's never lost on me that about six days into searching for our colleagues, we had a conversation as a team for what does life look like if we continue to search for another week, for another month, for another year. And in each one of these cases, you know, Dan Baru, Mohammed, the instances that Hussein is talking about, there are families that still have not finished, come to the end. And so it becomes an ongoing violation. Someone is unable to define whether they are a widow, whether they're a hopeful wife who is awaiting or continuing to sustain hope to find their husband. And even, you know, watching the video of Dan Baru and listening to us outside court with Victor, that was in 2018. You have to recognize we were celebrating a successful verdict from court, that a writ of habeas corpus had been issued and the court had even bravely gone ahead and said that we would want the DPP to charge this person with murder. The specific words of the court were, because he's been unable to produce this person in court, we can only conclude that he knows this person died and this person died within the station and so he's responsible. And so the person should be charged with murder. Dan Baru's wife is present in court, hearing the court declare that there should be a charge of murder. But that is still not an explanation to the fate of her husband. As she said then and has repeated severally, she still has not seen her, her husband. She has not buried her husband. And so we, we have a successful court process that has still not explained away the fate of the person who remains missing and there is still no accountability, meaning that we have a lag between what this person has experienced, what we have attempted to resolve through the law, and then what the reality is, that they, there is no accountability, there's no justice. And the other thing I think that um, should not be lost on us is the, and this also came up in the habeas corpus that the law society um, filed when Willie, Joseph and Josephat were missing, that the court talked about the complexity of the investigation and certain words that Justice Kimari used in his ruling, that it was tragic, that you're starting at the nature of investigation that is being undertaken at this point is first a family saying that their loved one has been disappeared, but you're coming to the state and the state is saying, no, your loved one is missing. And so you're starting at the start, you're getting late at the start line because no one is in agreement on what it is that has happened. And even as the you know, investigation is ongoing, you're searching for a loved one, but you're also very cognizant that you need to figure out who did it who is behind it, which agents of state were either um, participating in it, committed it, or acquiesced to this particular disappearance of a person. That whole transaction and the delay to actually deliver an investigation that is prompt, that is effective, that delivers also what Lee was talking about, truth to the families, that you can say to the family, this is what has happened. That sustained by the refusal of the state to acknowledge that someone has been disappeared. And I think Justice Kimaru in his ruling also talked about it. He said it was impossible to understand why despite an eyewitness saying that these people were at um, the camp, the higher police hierarchy de decided to continue to refuse that these people had disappeared or had at any point been detained within that camp. And so this whole transaction keeps these people completely outside the protection of the law. No law covers them in a manner that would 
respond to what they're experiencing would be would deliver a punishment that is commensurate to the nature of violence, but also would deliver accountability, that they would be able to have finality in saying, this is what happened to our loved ones, and this is the resolution of that particular incident. So it becomes a continuous cycle for these families over a period of time, a cycle that is, um, you know, to use the words of the DPP, an emotional one, but it is also an ongoing, an ongoing one without any legal criminal justice system structures that would support them towards its resolution. Thank you, Amaida. Thank you so much. Uh, we will now, before we actually move to the Law Society of Kenya, I think it is important for us to remember, and I think you've brought it out aptly, that these are people who are families, loved ones, colleagues, workmates, who never get closure. And that is something that we always need to remember that they're not statistics, they're not numbers, they're people, their names, their families. And we need to always keep that at the back burner because it is what drives us and it's what ideally we are here to ensure that we get justice for. So I will now turn to Agri who will direct the next. Before I go to the president of the Law Society, I'm informed that um, our senior Mr. Victor Kamau is back. <laughs> He had a small hitch with connection. So I'd just like to give him this opportunity um, so that he can finish his statement that he was making earlier. Thank you. Uh, yes, I would like to say that um, one thing that happened was that the family was clearly traumatized because the same person who was being accused of perpetrating the disappearance was confidently running the station, uh, nothing had been done to even maybe uh, take him away from the scene for a while. And you can imagine the family coming and they see him in court all the time, walking confidently in a GK and uh, coming back, going back to the station. I think that was one serious trauma to the family. And they even at one point considered giving up uh, the quest for the habeas corpus. Um, I, I got the sense, I'm very sorry to have to say this, but I believe it sincerely. I got the sense that the police uh, thought it's okay to kill a criminal. Uh, and they were, not they were not discouraged by their above. And I think that one problem we have is that there is general support from the upper echelons of the police uh, of extrajudicial killings, which is very worrying because then they will really never stop. Thank you. Thank you, Victor, for that very powerful conclusion to your statement. I'm sure it will inform a lot of the next steps that we take in pursuing justice for victims. I'd like now to welcome the president of the Law Society of Kenya, he had not joined by the time we were starting. Um, if he's with us, good morning, sir. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. This next question is to you. Um, the Law Society of Kenya has had a long history of tracing steps of the disappeared. In 2016, particularly, the Law Society was at the forefront of the habeas corpus case of Willy Kimani Joseph Moirore and Josphat Mwenda. How can the law society continue to be at the forefront of ensuring enforced disappearances are addressed through preventive mechanisms, for instance, law reform, in addition to responding to specific cases? Thank you. May I take this opportunity to apologize for my late entry into the discussion. They marks uh, four years since the disappearance and the eventual discovery of uh, the bodies of uh, our colleague Willy Kimani together with his clients. Therefore, took the opportunity to invite the family as well as the legal team of the law society that was behind the effort to press. We can't hear you so clearly. Is there a way the volume can be raised? Or if you could move closer to the to the to the camera. 
to the microphone, sorry. Okay, are you able to hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Let, let, me, let me start from where uh, we may have been left on account of poor transmission. Uh, today marks uh, four years since uh, the disappearance and eventual discovery of the bodies of the colleague Willy Kimani, his client, and his uh, taxi driver. We took the opportunity as a law society of Kenya to call uh, the widow of uh, the late Willy Kimani, as well as our legal team. And, and unfortunately, we seem to be losing you still. I think if you could have the mic much closer to the president. Sorry, let, let, let's just adjust this. Okay, are we, are we loud enough? Are we loud yes. enough now? Okay. Yes, now we can hear you. Now, uh, we, we took the opportunity of inviting the widow of uh, the late Willie Kimani, Anna Kimani, and uh, the legal team that was behind the habeas corpus. Uh, may I once more say that uh, the call we made four years ago, I am Willie, is still more relevant today uh, as, as it was uh, four years ago. Reason being, cases of forced disappearance which uh, often results in what we have come to see as uh, extrajudicial killings sanctioned by the state continue. What can we do to ensure that uh, this uh, does not happen? Or uh, what more can we do to ensure that we have adequate control of cases of this kind? The, the, the speakers who have spoken before me have enumerated uh, key areas. I think first and foremost is to ensure that there is completion of any prosecutorial process that is undertaken against culprits. And in this particular case, we want to call upon the Director of Public Prosecutions, who has been very helpful insofar as the case of Willie Kimani is concerned. We also want to call upon the judiciary to ensure that there is a speedy conclusion of this trial so that uh, the perpetrators of this crime are brought to book. This may be one of the cases where the law society may want to ask the president of the Republic of Kenya, whoever will be in office then, in the event that these uh, perpetrators are convicted, to, 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 to order the execution. Because as we speak, the death sentence is still in our books. What about uh, cases where directions have been merged for the arrest and prosecution of perpetrators of this crime. I've been to the police station in Kehancha and uh, I I've seen what happens there. It is high time that the director of public prosecution complied with the order that was made by Justice Murima and brought to book not only uh, Chief Inspector Sarem, but anybody who was in the vicinity of that police station within the hours that uh, Daniel is indicated to have been forcibly uh, made to disappear. And uh, in, 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 in the decision of the court, to have been killed. Now, there are other areas that need also to be addressed. Perhaps it may be an issue of reform. It may be also an issue of implementation. Insofar as reform is concerned, it is high time we got rid of these two terminologies plain clothes, plain cloth policemen, and unmarked cars. If a policeman is a policeman, let him be a policeman. Let the policeman be in uniform. Let the policeman be identified with his name, rank, and number. And let the policeman always move in a car that is identifiable as a car associated with the police. Because all these cases that we have discussed in, in, in today's debate relate to cases where the, 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 the perpetrators of uh, the disappearance eventually, for, for, for those cases where they've been brought to book, the killers are policemen. What has happened in developed countries? Let's look at the case of the United States of America. Save for the forces that are engaged in the accumulation of information, the Secret Service, the, 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 the FBI, other 
forces must be identified as forces so that we have the clarity whether we are dealing with a policeman or we are dealing with somebody who is likely to be a criminal passing himself out as a policeman. There may also be need for us to have uh, body cameras for policemen because uh, often uh, these incidences are perpetrated within the confine of a police station or in the course of performance of, uh, so to speak, the duties of a police uh, man. Kenya, as we speak, appears to have uh, put in place a very elaborate surveillance mechanism. If the police want to track you, they will track you within uh, three seconds. Why is it that uh, the central command of the police, those who hold the highest responsibility for the acts and omissions of policemen, cannot deploy these uh, this systems to, group, to, to, to bring to the book to ensure to the prosecution of those in their midst. And it should not be something new because the National Police Service must understand that it's there to serve the public. And I'll give you a comparison. If you look at us as advocates, we'll take disciplinary measures when one of us is suspected to have committed a case that amounts to misconduct. The police must realize that they are there to serve the Kenyan public. And uh, cases of uh, enforced disappearances, which eventually result in the extrajudicial killings, are those that must be investigated. And uh, towards this end, I think also there is a role that must be played more effectively by IPOA. IPOA has not performed its role effectively. And we look at uh, the, the prevailing environment, what has happened during the intervening period when measures have been put in place to combat COVID, restrictions of movement, curfews. How have the police behaved? I'm sure there are many people who have been forcefully uh, made to disappear within this period. Uh, what has IPOA done? What can we do as the Law Society of Kenya? It, it is imperative as the Law Society of Kenya that we move this step forward. We ensure that we have in place legislation sufficient and strong enough to protect the people of Kenya from forced disappearances and extrajudicial killings. There is also a role that must be played by the judiciary effectively. On the 16th of April, 2020, a decision was made by the High Court of Kenya in which it was recognized that the police had used unreasonable force in the enforcement of the curfew order. However, despite sufficient evidence before the court of about five people who had been killed by the police, and in a manner to suggest that there was no need for the use of unreasonable force, the court did not go the extra mile as requested to hold the Inspector General of Police personally liable for, for, for the death of those five uh, Kenyans and also for the damage to property and also for the harm to many people who were documented before the court as having suffered injuries. Some of them aggravated injuries. And uh, the doctrine of uh, superior responsibility, if I may use it in the most simplistic term, is one that is recognized in many regimes. And the only way in which we can uh, progress insofar as this issue is concerned is to have the courts embrace this doctrine. And uh, let me go back to the case of uh, uh, Inspector Tarem. Why is it that uh, the high command of the police has not been held accountable uh, in view of the directions that were made by Justice Morima that uh, Inspector Sarem must be charged for the murder of Daniel. And uh, it must be an effort by everybody, uh, both state and non-state actors, to ensure that uh, the issue of implementation and reform is taken into uh, effectively. Otherwise, we will be pulling at different directions because as the law society, we depend substantially 
on uh, the, 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 the offices of the director of public prosecution to ensure that the prosecution of those who have been identified as culprit. We also depend substantially on the offices of the director of criminal investigations, as well as the, office, the offices of uh, the inspector general of police and IPOA. And uh, I believe if this can be done in a united effort, we'll be able to make progress to combat and eradicate cases of uh, enforced disappearances. Thank you, um, senior, London senior and uh, president, Law Society, um, Nelson Harvey. And thank you to all the council members who have come uh, together with you today in making that statement, as well as the advocates who've been involved in the case of uh, Willie, Joseph, and Josphat for the good work that you continue to do. And we hope that even in this work to uh, ensure justice for enforced disappearances, we will be able to work together to achieve progress in this country. We are now getting into the session of uh, plenary. And uh, just to let you know, we have with us also Giuliani, who is an artist that has been involved in this journey a lot. And at the end of this um, webinar, he will be performing a number that is very familiar uh, to those who followed um, the, the commemoration of Willie, Joseph, and Josphat in the last uh, four years. I'd like to invite now Julie to ask the first question. Um, thank you very much, uh, Agri. Thank you very much to our panelists for the great insights. The questions are directed at the chat section, so some of you can go on to the chat section and respond to them after the close of the webinar, because unfortunately we will not have enough time to address all of them. But top on our mind is Madam Margaret Owande has asked, has the human rights agencies protected people giving information? This question is directed to Haki Africa. Has human rights organizations given the requisite protection to witnesses who have information? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Margaret. And that's a very, very important question, particularly in addressing enforced disappearances because uh, witnesses are key uh, in this matter. Uh, as human rights agencies, uh, we have actually done that, but uh, we must also remember that that's, there's an agency that has that mandate, the Witness Protection Agency. So we've had instances where we've worked with the Witness Protection Agencies to ensure witnesses are safe, but uh, in uh, a few cases, We've actually done that ourselves. I know also the National Coalition for Human Rights Defenders, the Defenders Coalition, has also um, addressed uh, the issue of witnesses. Myself, for example, uh, I've uh, been a beneficiary of uh, witness protection. So yes, indeed, we've done that. And we would like to encourage witnesses to continue coming forward. And we assure you that uh, through the witness protection agencies and mechanisms by civil society, that you will be protected and we have to prosecute these uh, people who are responsible for the disappearances. Indeed, to add to that, I know IJM, ICJ Kenya, uh, the Kenya National Human Rights uh, Commission, we are more than willing to support in the protection of witnesses who have information pertaining to a specific human rights violation. Now to the next question. Thank you. The next question uh, is directed to Madam Lee Fang from the UN uh, Office of the Human Rights um, High Commissioner. And the question is, when can UN agencies come down to local communities when such violations occur? Thanks. Um, I mean, people are very welcome to, to, to reach out to us. And, and maybe if for the person who asked the question, maybe if, uh, if you can give the, your contact details to the organizers so that we can follow up. Um, just also to note that we were, we're working very closely with all the organizations that are, that are part of this panel today, um, with uh, ICJ, IJM, Haki Africa, with the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, with the Defenders Coalition, um, also working with human rights defenders in, in communities. So it's, we're, we're also supporting the work that, um, that Kenyan human rights um, activists and organizations are doing, but um, our, our, doors are, our, our doors are open and we're, we're very happy to hear from, from people. Thank 
election is to the president of the Law Society of Kenya, Mr. Nelson Harvey, is from Sheila Leona. She asks, should the families who have had their loved one lost receive compensation where disappeared persons are the breadwinners? Well, uh, it is a difficult question, but uh, one for which uh, I think we may look upon history for, for an answer. And unfortunately, money has been uh, for a long period of time been identified as the only mode of compensating any, any loss uh, of whatever kind. It, it is therefore our view that uh, yes, money should be received as compensation, but much more must be done because, uh, well, money may enable you to take uh, the, the children of the deceased uh, to school. It may enable you to pay rent. It may enable you to pay your bills. But it will never bring back uh, one who has been forcibly disappeared and uh, who the court, as a result of uh, the long duration of the disappearance, has concluded that is uh, for all practical purposes uh, dead. Uh, way forward, I think over and above money, uh, strong pronouncements must be made by the court, as I've uh, indicated much earlier, so that uh, we, 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 we have uh, a determination, for instance, that holds the, the, the Inspector General of Police culpable, that holds the, the, the OCS or the OSPD in charge of a particular station, that holds the commander of a particular battalion uh, responsible. Let's you look at the case of uh, uh, Willie Kimani, for instance. I, I highly doubt that uh, a murder of this uh, magnitude could have been committed and concealed without the knowledge of the superiors of the officers currently facing murder charges in court. It, it, it's, it's unlikely. And uh, it, it is therefore very important that we go to the person who holds the highest responsibility, the central command, the, the commander of, uh, of, of, of uh, the individuals who have been found culpable. So that as soon as they are dealt with, we may say for a fact, that those who will come after him will realize that the power they hold is for the trust and benefit of the Kenyan public and not for the achievement of their own personal goals. Because there's credible merit in the publicly held view that these individuals who are currently facing murder charges, Willie Kimani, uh, his client, and this taxi driver, had been used before by the state for extrajudicial killings. And it was only because of the enormous pressure that we put to bear upon the state that the director of criminal investigation came to court and agreed to facilitate the discovery and investigations that led to, to what we have now. I, I, I believe they knew, and something must be done to make them responsible. Remember the Nuremberg trial? That is where we need to go in so far as matters of this kind are concerned. Thank you, Mr. President. This next question we'd like to direct to uh, Victor Kamau from the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights. And it is a question regarding the fact that um, the right to a habeas corpus is a right that cannot be limited under Article 25 of the Constitution. What is the consequence to the police when they fail to produce a disappeared person, dead or alive, pursuant to an order of the court? I'm told um, Victor is not online. That is fine. I'd like to direct the same question to Wamaida Kimani. I can hear. Yeah. Thank you, Juma. Yes. Although I hear Victor's voice. Yes, I can hear you. OK. Are you in a position to respond to that question? Yes, certainly. Um, in the experience, for example, of the uh, Baru case, 
an order was made that Mr. Serem was in contempt of court because of failing to produce uh, Baru. And for that contempt, uh, he was now uh, deemed to be the person who murdered uh, Baru. So the consequences are, are unspecific because um, there's really not been a, a good test case. I remember that long, long ago, uh, the, uh, the court ordered the police to go and actually dig graves to find the person. So um, when this happens, the consequences clearly are uh, the consequences of a contaminant of court who can be punished. Um, and, and, and I think that uh, decision that he should be charged for murder came hot on the heels of that finding of contempt by the court. Thank you. Um, Wamaida, <clears throat> any additions to that as we close? Uh, thank you, Juma. I think my addition to that would be the penalty for a contemnor for someone found in contempt of court is six months. And I think that becomes the limitation of the writ of habeas because we, you know, we went back to court severally with uh, that contempt of court application that the OCS who had been ordered to produce done dead or alive uh, did not produce. And I think it is the reason why the court in that particular case then chose to truly give a bold um, ruling and say, no, if you are unable to produce him, then it would mean you know where he is, you know he is dead, he is dead, and I want the DPP to charge. So I think that that also becomes where the penalty is not commensurate with what the family has uh, encountered. And it is necessary to then have in the law a definition of enforced disappearances as a crime, as well as a punishment and some form of redress that is comp commensurate to that. Thank you. Thank you for that, Wamaida. Um, I'd like to direct this very final question to Madam Dorcas Odur, who is also with us. Welcome, Madam. Thank you. So um, this question comes from George Odiambo, and he asks, um, police never identify themselves, especially in the slums, before conducting any search or arrests. How can this be resolved? Thank you so much, and I want to thank everybody. And uh, I want to say that it is my pleasure to represent the DPP. As uh, the president of the Law Society said, there are some reforms that have to be undertaken within the police and the criminal justice agencies. And I think one of the most important one is that the police on the beat who are doing uh, normal police work should identify themselves. And this is one thing that I'm going to take over to the DPP and I would ask him to uh, consult with the IG to see that the police who are doing normal routine policing work are in uniform, identifiable, they wear identification um, tags, and if possible, they travel in police vehicles, which I think is possible. So I think what, that is one of the areas from this webinar that we can take forward and make sure that it is implemented one way or another. Secondly, we could also have body cameras. And I think one of the things that we didn't talk about is the role of other institutions other than criminal justice agencies. And what I have in mind is that county governments, con 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 uh, 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 members of parliament and everybody must ensure that we have cameras on our roads, especially in the slums. I think it is very important to put cameras at strategic places, CCTV cameras, so that at least once in a while we are able to pick up some of these things that we are unable to see with our naked eyes uh, during the day. So that is taken forward. And I think that's one of the recommendations that we're going to make. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. All right. Thank you very much to our panelists for interacting with our audience and answering all the questions that have been posited to you. I want to now do a one minute part. So this is where each and every panelist says a one minute parting shot. 
One thing that we take away from this conversation that we can now action. So I want to start with Mr. Victor Kamau. What is your one minute parting shot? What is the takeaway from this conversation? Kamau, please unmute your microphone. Need, can you hear me? Yes, yes um, we can. can. Okay, we need uh, reforms and we need definitely to uh, make Kenya compliant with the international um, convention on uh, the protection of all persons from uh, enforced disappearance. And we still want to know where Dan Baru Yamohanga is. We have not given that up. Um, to Hussein Halib, what is your one minute parting shot? Um, I think my parting shot is actually directed to the families of uh, those who have been uh, forcefully disappeared. Um, individuals like Najim who began this uh, with uh, the family of uh, Hosni Khalid and Bara give up hope. You are fighting an evil that is within our communities and you're not just fighting for your family, but you're fighting for the entire society. There is no justification whatsoever for enforced disappearances and we must work together and without the families, then we don't have anything. Continue um, hoping and uh, we will stand with you and we must eradicate this practice in Kenya. But you are my there. Uh, thank you, Julie. I think my part in short would be twofold. First, that in order for us to move forward, we must look backward. So just as you know, Victor is talking about his, he mentions a specific case, Hassan, uh, Hussein speaks of other cases. There is need to have a resolution to those cases that come up from the past. I know Kenya National have reports, uh, the cry for blood, the era of fighting terror with terror, other you know, missing voices have documented cases of people who have disappeared. There needs to be efforts directed towards a closure to those particular processes that we would not gather you know, in a year from now and those families are still either hopeful or frustrated or unable to have a resolution or an answer to what fit has befallen their loved one. And then secondly, the need to criminalize. Um, we, we must legislate on this issue, we must define it in the law, we must uh, define the means of recourse, and we must also define the punishment for it. And Julie, just to stretch, I think one thought that can't be left unsaid, and I think Wairimo has asked it to the panelists, is the issue of value-based policing. We must realize in each one of these instances where someone is deprived of their liberty, they are within either the confines or the precincts of a police station, an AP camp, or have been moved by agents of state. There were many, many, many other officers who had an opportunity to intercept this incident of a disappearance before it um, escalated into a killing. I think there's need to have a lot of effort towards culture change within the police service, that there would be efforts that promote reporting of incidences of misconduct by officers, uh, by fellow officers, so that there's an, we arrest these um, incidences before they get to the point where it is fatal. So I think that the police reform efforts also need to be very intentional, not just in the accountability mechanisms, but also in the culture change, that we would have more police officers who choose to do the right thing and report these particular incidences. For that. Um, as we are doing the parting shots, I'd like to inform our participants that we are not really going away. We are setting the space for Giuliani to do a closing performance. So please do not log out after the last parting shots. We still have a performance that is going to be done in a few minutes. Um, the next parting shot that you're going to have is from Miss Lee. Lee, what is your takeaway from this conversation? I think it's been a really valuable um, webinar, and I think it also shows what um, what common purpose we all have um, between the panelists and also the participants in ending and, uh, and seeking justice for enforced disappearances. Um, my parting shot would be to call on us all together to continue to press for justice, 
and to, to, con to continue to press for the effective investigations and um, accountability for enforced disappearances and for the killings that are, that are linked to them. I think that this requires reforms, but it also re requires a strong, cohesive push for, for these efforts. And I think that this shows, uh, today's webinar shows that we've, we've got a, a strong coalition to, to work with. I would also um, agree with Wamaida on, on the need to criminalize enforced disappearances. If you don't have any, if you don't have a crime to prosecute, then it makes it even harder to, to do so. Um, and lastly, I think that there's, um, there's for in, when looking at the families of the disappeared, it's really important for us to press for the right to truth and also to continue to press for reparations for enforced disappearances, for extrajudicial killings and for serious human rights violations in general in, in Kenya. Thank you. Much and to our most final panelist, um, Ms. Dorcas, you have joined us for this conversation and we are happy to have you. What is your parting shot from this discourse and what can we do going forward? Uh, thank you again. I think the most important tool that a prosecutor needs to um, undertake prosecution is the law. I therefore think that it is important that we review the law with regard to forced disappearance to have very clear legislation on this. We need to ratify the international instruments. And above all, I think there is a need and the DPP had spoken about it before for all those involved to ventilate and see how we can develop jurisprudence on issues of superior responsibility and command and responsibility. Although prosecution comes at the tail end, it's almost like post-mortem, but I think if we apply properly and uh, develop jurisprudence on superior responsibility and command and responsibility, it will be a deterrence, it will deter. And um, I want to tell you that the DPP or the ODPP does not condone these kind of things. We don't protect those who commit offenses. We have now a fully fledged unit to deal with police excesses and uh, soon or later we'll be calling upon all the actors and all the stakeholders to come together so that we see how we can put in place policies and guidelines to deal with this. We want every Kenyan to feel protected and to feel that the institutions that have been put in place under the constitution actually are responsive to the people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, to our president of the Law Society of Kenya, we wish to thank you for being here with the council. Kindly give us your parting shot for this important discussion, bearing in mind that the Law Society has even given a purple ribbon campaign. So this is definitely at the forefront of the heart of the Law Society of Kenya. So what is your parting shot from this important discussion that we have had today? Uh, is the mouth mine? I, I did hear what... Uh... Mr. President, I'm sorry we didn't get you there. Um, we are now winding down and we are doing a wind down with a one minute parting shot from every panelist. And we were thanking you for coming on board with your council. First of all, we wish to thank the council for being here and commemorating this day. And we wanted to know what is your one minute parting shot from this webinar? What can we take away from this discussion? My takeaway is this, the call we made uh, four years ago, I am willing, must never depart our lips, it must never depart our ears. And this is important for many reasons. One, because in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s and the 90s, the prevalence of forced disappearance targeted politicians. In the recent past, it has targeted many, many more than politicians. It has targeted professionals. It has targeted witnesses. It has targeted suspects. It is not in the hands of anybody to take anybody's life. However big the grievance, however aggravated the dissatisfaction, the right of life is provided for in the Bill of Rights. It can never be in the hands of the police or the state to determine, unless otherwise decreed by a court of law, that life must come to an end, that one must be forcefully disappeared, and in certain cases, 
uh, him because of what the policeman or anybody acting under the direction of the state perceives to be the shortest way possible of solving a problem. We must always be willing because we do not want to have any other willing. Will is you and I. Thank you. That is as strong as it gets, and that is our parting shot from all our panelists. Thank you so much for being here. And now over to you, Agri. As promised, we have with us Giuliani, an artist who has walked this journey with most of us who have been in it. And today he will be uh, performing uh, one of his famous um, uh, numbers, Machozi Yajana. And just before he does that, I'd like to ask him a question. Giuliani, welcome. Hey, Thank you. You have been part of many um, difficult conversations. Some of them are yeah. corruption, some are human rights. Yeah, what right. has been the most impactful <laughs> moment <laughs> in this journey for you? Hey, you sorry. I would like to say that. What happened? I didn't realize that when we were growing up, it was easy because when we were growing up, people used to get killed every week. Young people used to get killed every week. But we, it was like a rite of passage, you know. You get killed because you're a thug and to Nasao. Ama, some people just get killed because they got killed. But this is somebody who was killed idea. So it means he, he, even the people who are, who are seeing themselves as people at Asaidia Badai, they were deterred to even try it because they know the consequences that comes with helping and going out of your way to see justice. Mm -hmm. So I put into your uh, monumental and, and uh, based on how I look at life na, and how I look at systems and situations and governance and all this. Mm -hmm. So, and that's why, of course, Niko Kwaijani. And I'm trying to use my stage and my voice to make sure that uh, easy message is a So, So, uh, thank you for being here. I And it's okay, in a serious moment. And I really, really want us to, to uh, this song, I hope it, it capture our hearts, it capture our, our, our hearts and everything we think about right now. I'll see you. So, Nashkuru Namba Tuende. He said they left the chest on the boxes, the guineas are handkerchief. My children, the Uzam Changa, my topo, when you in the rest, he see what's up to me, my Rudy took left. While you were cutting my power, who see fly again. Again, yeah, again, yeah. Clouds in the air, bony black, match in the bed, palace are big. It's a long day, could you a lot me short? Life I not remote. When as a fast forward, I'm only one to a happier episode. My chose your jana, high gandhi, to not bangus in a braha, your justice. To my way, to our way, la 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 salama, to my way. Sabapo, <laughs> Tu tu awe, la la, 
la la salama Tuko na we Tuko na we Tapatana Mapuazi ya jana Mungu ujua Tia zangu ya tengezi Ale siwezi ya sungezi Wewe ndiye nguvu ya wanyingi Wewe mungu ujua Tia zangu ya tengezi Ale siwezi ya sungezi Wewe ndiye nguvu ya wanyingi Na lile atima wajane kama ana My spouse Tamu time for justice Is done kamaji kwa mpereji Set out Blackers See what I do in the way in here behind bars Enough is enough Utuzi ya nasa isa ibinda ni ya haas Usi blame you for decimation Kito ni patia direction Tuko na we Tuko na we La 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 salama Tuko na we Tuko na we Tuko na we Machozi ya tana Tuko na we Chuki awe Na Na la salama Tuko na we Chuki awe Chuki awe Machozi ya tana As I continue on, I just wanted to say this, like in the US, Nayin Mambuan Abdul Apaju, Abdul, um, those who are PVIC German and BM, that in the US is the black, and in Kenya is the poor. So, where did that see also? So, the next song I like to do in a tour, Utawala, and I hope Yani, um, all of us take personal responsibility to make sure that a right, a right of each and every, especially the vulnerable and the weak in the community, is in a four to also number the next song. Sita sima na maubu ya kita Sita sima na maubu Nifisadi ubina sika bila Nusa sura wataki kuna sera Umbugu Kufani Sita simana Naudu ya kita Sita simana Hatu ya kibadifa Una deserve Bila kasha makashifa Ni society Kenya wanaeza Share ni nyungu ya busa Ama kete ule ashisha Mkuko unasia eko Unajwa tamandi ya mali Na sales ya kifuli Eyo Ujaibi wa juwa Unataki to vote Risking daytime police bullets So, uneza argue Crime doesn't pay Nakini wezi dismiss justice in a bay Mwizi ya na 40 days 365 days later Anyani la kukuo fata Do anything for power Ready to lose their head for presidency Bora wa yone kwa currency Sababu kwa ni sick of fake Kenya turbulence Niki fly and run Nimezo the same feeling Matatu siki piti ya photo Nisa ane Wili kimane Yeah, yeah Ikonji Hata siyezi karangu Uwe hae Chagala bagala Niko tae Kulipa garamu Sika suma Mama uwe Sika suma Mama uwe Usisadi ubina si ukabizi Ukiza shura wataki kuza vera Mungu Nikofa ahe Sika sima mama uwe ya kita wala Sika sima mama uwe Dover is fun, it a video raised hands Growing concern, breakfast a croissant Ntaki pungu sepe ya bitha 
Sunataka opportunities Ndeo shwa for these obita Walisema kutembe ya kuingi Ndeo kuwa na mengi Ni mechinda ni kutembe ya maofisi Na shai yona kazi Kazi says a drop when you tight your boot Mambo si barabara chingu Naomba jani masu Chakule fike chumboni ikitoka kwa sahani Policeman anapija rungu Mwalimu dachari ya namurushe kia gasu Na mpeto wake ya nasukuki sana lipo Winners Nikonji Hapa siyesi karanga Uwe hae Shagala baga Niko tayari Kulipagara Sita sima Uwe kitaya Sita sima Ufisadi Ufina si ukapiri Ufisa sura Watakiku Ufasera what did you get over you need to slap somebody? Go play with his side, he can't lose any 50 box t-shirts, stick your campaign, kill it for free. Ne five be alone investment. Utali back in the parliament. We are one, Amandi, we are one now. Utu me shi for water. Utu, missing, CCTV, we were watching. Relation security, na job opportunity. Nika, mti ya kipiriti. Side moja heavy. Usinembia Kenya kuna umaskini. Kwa ni hizi fat singers, zina hizi ya nane. Maskando, zina twete na wa survival. Uwe hae Shagala paga Niko tayari Tulipa garamu Sika sima Sika sima Sika sima Sika sima Sika sima Sika sima Asante ni that's my number. <laughs> How many numbers?